So there's this thing in Marcus Aurelius, the meditations, that I've never quite understood, where he keeps saying throughout the book, he keeps saying, either there is providence or atoms. And I think I kind of get what that means, but I've always found it a little puzzling. And this week, I think I finally kind of cracked it. I figured out what he's talking about. And no joke, one of the first things that I thought was, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to tell the Young Heretics people about this. I'm so glad you're here. I know it's mushy, but I really am grateful to have this platform where I've gathered people around me that will be excited, as I am, to talk about free will, fate, providence, and atoms, and to discover this thing that I think I've finally figured out in Marcus Aurelius. And it actually brings me to talking to something that I've wanted to talk with you guys about for a long time. And I've kind of mentioned it, touched on it here and there in the show, but now I want to look at it head on. And it's this story about the transformation in modern physics that happened when we moved away from determinism, from this idea about the universe that everything is kind of locked into an absolute path and nothing can be anything other than it is because cause and effect is perfectly kind of in line with the rules of mathematics and science. And what really finally did it for me was figuring out the relationship between this modern transformation that we've gone through in the last, I don't know, 100 years or so, and the ancient debate over free will and determinism, which is some of what I was talking about last week when we dealt with Faust and the problem of repentance and whether you can actually make a free choice. And I was saying then that we all know we have free choice. We all experience the world as free creatures who are able to make choices. And yet there's something quite mysterious about that, something even paradoxical, because we're also able to observe the world around us and see that it follows a regular pattern of order. And this has become more acute for us in the wake of the scientific revolution, as we've learned to understand the order of the physical world more and more precisely. But we're not the first people to have this problem. That's one of the things that I was emphasizing last time, is that debate has gone on for a long time, because at least since the ancient Greeks, and really probably since the ancient Babylonians, and maybe before, a central part of our life on this earth is our ability to see patterns, and the weird fact that when we reason using the patterns that we see in the world, we are often able to predict what's going to happen next. Not always, we're not perfect, and we can't encapsulate the whole world in our minds. There's always stuff outside the edges of our experience. There's always something more beyond. But at the same time, we are able, within the remit of our experience, to see things and, and make predictions and understand the world from within the world. And this creates a situation where we sort of expect then that the world should lock together into this regular pattern of order. But if that's true, then how can it be that we have free will, which seems to come from kind of outside of that order? Because if you can make a choice that isn't predetermined by the things that happened before, by the way you were brought up, by the particular chemicals that happen to be in your body at this time, by all the different biological inputs that you're experiencing, then there is something, namely you, namely the soul, that can sort of interrupt the regular patterns of nature. So this incredibly paradoxical thing is that the very thing which enables us to understand the patterns of the world, which is the mind or the consciousness or the soul, is also the thing that doesn't fit into the patterns of the world. And this is actually getting right to the heart of basically every major problem in modern science, which is one of the things I want to talk to you about today, but it is also part of this ancient debate. And now that we've done Christopher Marlowe's Faust, we have an opportunity, I think, to kind of look at this story, tell this story head on as a way of getting into 
uh, Goethe's Faust. So there are actually two famous plays about Dr. Faustus, this magician, and his uh, decide, decision to sell his soul to the devil. There's Christopher Marlowe's Elizabethan play, which I've talked about, and then there's Goethe's romantic German play, which I'm going to talk about later on. But in the middle, as a little scientific interlude, I would like to tell you the story of Pierre-Simon Laplace, Ludwig Boltzmann, and Max Planck. By, by way of Marcus Aurelius and the Epicureans. Buckle up. It's going to be a real journey, and I'm very excited about it. It starts with this thing that I have talked about a little bit that I want to now talk to you more about, which is this guy, Pierre-Simon Laplace. And Laplace is going to come across maybe a little bit as sort of the villain of this story, which is really not fair, because in his day, and really in any day, <laughs> Laplace was kind of a G. Like, this guy... First of all, one of the most accomplished physicists of his era, which is to say the 18th century in France, one of the greatest Newtonian physicists in the generation just after Newton had figured out the laws that describe sort of macroscopic observable physical motion within the human scale. And this was obviously one of the major revolutions in science. One of the things it did is it destroyed the idea that there was a physical boundary at the orbit of the moon. It was called the superlunary and the sublunary realms, the idea that there was a, a region beneath and below, beneath rather and above the moon, and that things behaved differently in outer space than they do down here. Newton showed that, at least for macroscopic objects, that's not true, that actually there is one set of rules that can describe the physical motions of the whole universe. And that was a major turning point on this journey toward thinking of the universe as a machine that has these parts that move in understandable ways. Newton described this backdrop of absolute space and absolute time, where if you think of that as like the neutral, invisible backdrop, everything else is just playing out in this big, giant box of space, and all these objects are moving around, and we can describe them with these very simple laws, and that this created uh, the impression and gave rise to a whole new strain of determinism, because as I was just saying at the beginning, if you think that everything is locked into these rules and into these laws, then you're going to think that everything is fated, essentially, that there's nothing that can, can happen any way other than the way that it happens. And... Newton himself was not that kind of absolutist, was not so extreme, didn't make such vast claims for his rules as to say that everything could be described in these automatic mathematical ways. And one reason why is he understood something that I've been talking about a lot on the show, which is that there is such a thing as metaphysics. There has to be something outside of the order of nature, because if there weren't, again, we would have no souls, we would have no free will, and if you have no free will, then you don't really have the ability to do rational thought. In order to be rational, to think in a way that can be right or wrong, you have to genuinely be thinking of your own volition, not just according to your automatic, spontaneous biological processes. Because if that's all that is, then there's no such thing as true or false. There's just sort of what you happen to automatically be thinking. And so Newton understood all of this stuff, but the power of his own reasoning was so great in its field, in the region of the physical world, that it started to seem as if it had crowded out all those other concerns. And physicists would either kind of bracket the mind. They, you know, one thing that Descartes, for example, did is he just said the mind is kind of its own thing and the physical world is is a machine, or they would simply deny, or they would forget that such a thing existed as the mind or the soul or the spiritual world, and they would come to treat it as sort of a fictional fairy tale because it couldn't be described in these pure Newtonian or even Galilean terms of quantity, right? This much stuff is moving to this place. And Laplace was the scion, the great prophet of that Newtonian extreme. And I call it Newtonian advisedly because it would have horrified Newton himself. Newton would never have thought that this was an appropriate set of conclusions to draw from his laws. But people like Laplace and often many 
French interpreters of, of Newton were so skilled at using Newton's laws that they were able to create the illusion that there was nothing beyond the laws. And so this guy, you know, I'm going to present him as kind of the mouthpiece of peak determinism in the wake of the scientific revolution. And it's important to understand him that way because that's where our current sort of reflexive ideas about this stuff come from. We don't understand ourselves unless we understand this moment in history where Newton's laws were taken and used for a sort of political or even a theological project where they were taken to mean that the whole world is is a machine and, and kind of determinist. And, and Laplace is absolutely one of the culprits in that story. There is no question. But all of that having been said, that's not because he was some sort of scheming maniac who just hated everything good and didn't want us to have nice things. He was a brilliant mind, and he <laughs> lived through, his life would make a kind of an amazing biopic, because he lived through and made major scientific contributions in no fewer than three regimes in France. This was, you may be aware, a time of incredible political turmoil in, in France, much as the 1700s saw the birth of America. They also saw the French Revolution. And so Laplace begins his career in the monarchy pre French Revolution, survives the French Revolution, which not every great scientist did, by the way. Lavoisier, one of the great chemists of that time, in fact, one of the fathers of modern chemistry, was, was killed in the Revolution, but Laplace didn't have such elevated ancestry that the maniacs of the revolution came for him. So he stayed on and worked on problems like longitude and latitude, the measures that we now use to navigate the globe. That was a big thing that he worked on during the period of the Republic and then survived. He was actually one of the examiners at the uh, École Militaire, the, the military school, where uh, Napoleon was coming up. And so he examined Napoleon and then briefly became one of the sort of functionaries in Napoleon's retinue in, in, in his cabinet. And it was there that the anecdote ar arises. We're not totally sure if this happened or whether it's quite true, but it's said that Napoleon was the one who asked Laplace, you know, I've read your new book and I don't see any place for God in your description of the universe. Where is God in your maths? And Laplace said, I have no need for that hypothesis. He said it in French, but of course with that snooty accent, right? I have no need for that hypothesis, meaning God is not a necessary component of this new hyper-Newtonian picture of the universe that I'm drawing. And that's where, for example, Stephen Meyer, my good friend whom I admire very much, wrote his book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. So this guy, even if maybe not all of us have heard of him before, Laplace is a major, major kingpin in this intellectual history of how we get to the sort of determinist reading of the scientific revolution. And, and it's not because you have to be a determinist in order to believe in Newtonian physics. It's because Newtonian physics can give the illusion, if you're not careful, that the universe is determinist. And so Laplace has sort of gone down in history for basically his worst ideas, which is something that will often happen, that the person's most extreme or crazy thought kind of gets stamped in the memory because it was extreme and because it caught on and had a lot of currency. But there's lots of other stuff we could remember Laplace for. Like, you know, he was had a, one of the most important applications of a, a solution to the three-body problem, which is this famous now problem in physics that it's impossible to find a general equation that always describes the motion of three bodies that are exerting the influence of gravity on each other. There was one instance, a version of this, called the, the Euler three-body problem, which is a special case. And as part of Euler's solution to that, Laplace developed kind of a, a new way of, of looking at it that helped him to resolve a big problem in the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. It's a whole thing. We don't have to get into it right now, but it was like a big part of his making his name. He's a, a brilliant mind, but also very much susceptible to this illusion that the world is a Newtonian machine, which Newton himself would never have co-signed. In fact, st argued strenuously against this idea. And so what I want to do first is just read to you from an essay that became famous that Laplace wrote on probabilities. 
and it was a lecture, initially a lecture in 1795, the, entitled the, the Analytical Theory of Probabilities. And it, it's actually just the opening that is famous. And so that's the part that I'm going to read because it describes and expresses exactly this determinist idea. All events, says Laplace, even those which on account of their insignificance do not seem to follow the great laws of nature, are a result of it just as necessarily as the revolutions of the sun. So a strong opening sentence, right? Everything that happens is the same kind of thing as the revolutions of the sun or the orbits of the planets. In other words, the rules that allow us to describe celestial mechanics can also allow us to account for and explain everything, all events. In ignorance of the ties which unite such events to the entire system of the universe, they have been made to depend upon final causes or upon hazard. Now, final causes, of course, is a loaded Aristotelian term. The telos, the, the purpose of a thing, is one of Aristotle's four causes for events, and it's in some ways the most important one because it asserts or suggests that there is inherent in things a uh, directionality, that chairs want to be the cheriest chair they can be, and flowers want to be the floweriest flower they can be. And a flower is probably a better example than a chair, because chairs are man-made artifacts, but flowers are natural entities. That is to say, they have their principle of change within themselves. If they have a final cause, then the motion and the growth of the flower can, in some sense, be explained through its not quite consciously wanting to be, but tending to be flowery, to, to, to its floweriness. And this, says Laplace, is an illusion because everything just comes out of the mechanical workings, what Aristotle might have called the material or the efficient causes of things, that, that the machine just generates the flower and then the flower dies. And the death of the flower in this telling, this is very important, when you, when you look at the world without final causes, death is just as natural as life. Whereas when you look at the world with final causes, you say, in some sense, the flower is naturally tending toward its most flourishing floweriness. And when it's really in bloom and beautiful, that's when it's kind of moving to its final cause. And then death and decay is, in some sense, a falling away from the energy of the flower. It's becoming less flowery rather than more. But if you don't have a final cause, then the death of the flower is just another stage in this ever-churning, endless machinery of things. So that's what Laplace is talking about here. And this is why it's called an essay on probabilities, because he's asserting that we could, if we had enough information, know the probability of every event. And in some sense, everything that happened would have a probability of, a, of 100%. So here's the really famous part where he talks about this. He says, we ought then to regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its anterior state and as the cause of the one which is to follow, given for one instant an intelligence which could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated and the respective situation of the beings who compose it, an intelligence sufficiently vast to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in the same formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the lightest atom. The, the use of atom in that sense is sort of trendy in this moment, right? Because the theory of atomism, which is an ancient theory, as I'm going to get into, is, is becoming important. Not for it, that is for this mind that knew all the right initial conditions, nothing would be uncertain. And the future, as the past, would be present to its eyes. This is called Laplace's demon. It's really, you have to be a pretty influential thinker to have a demon named after you. But the demon, which is not necessarily an evil demon, although I think it, it, might, it actually might be, but a daimon is just a kind of divine spirit or something. So the imaginary thought experiment here is if you had a mind that effectively, the modern way you might put this is if you had a mind that knew the position and the momentum of every particle in the universe at any one time, at this moment or in five seconds from now or 10 years from now, then that mind that could know all of those things would also know the entirety of history, past, present, and future, because implicit in those momenta and in those 
positions, those initial conditions, would be the entire history and future of the universe because it is all a giant machine. And one interesting thing about this is it really closely resembles, I think, what we picture when we think of a perfect supercomputer. And often, I suspect, when we are talking about cyborgs or AI or these kind of dystopian sci-fi futures that we imagine, we're, we're picturing computers that can do this at, at some sort of very high or even perfect level, that they kind of know so much data that they know what's going to happen, what you're going to think next better than you do. And it's based on this Laplacean idea of Laplace's demon, which is kind of a perfect human mind. So one way of reading Laplace is to say, He's, he's basically saying if human minds were more perfect than they are, then we would be as gods. And in fact, that's sort of the next thing he says. The human mind offers in the perfection which it has been able to give to astronomy a feeble idea of this intelligence. In other words, the kind of understanding that we have when we do our best math and our best physics is the fullest, deepest, most profound and penetrating understanding of reality. And if we dialed up that understanding to 11, like it's currently at 0 0.01, and if we dialed it up to 11, then the resolution on our picture of the world would be total, and our knowledge would be omniscient in this kind of all-encompassing way, that in some sense we would stand outside of the universe that we now stand within. And that would make us like these perfect minds that can see everything and, and know everything. It would make us basically like supercomputers. And this is also very closely related to a philosophy or a theology that was major around this time. In fact, had an influence on some of the founding fathers called deism, where God is like a, an absentee mechanic, essentially. He's created this machine, but he doesn't intervene in it, and he doesn't do miracles, and he doesn't change the course of nature, because we know through science now, right, it's the, it's the dawn of reason, it's the 18th century, we know from science that, that everything operates according to mathematical natural laws, so how can God be intervening and doing miracles and all of that? He must, if he exists, he must have just set the universe spinning, a big clockmaker, and he stands outside of it and watches. And we too can become clockmakers, standing outside of the universe and observing it from within. And you'll already guess what my problem is with this. First of all, of course, we're not outside the universe, and even the observations that we now make aren't from this pure standpoint outside of nature, even the ones that we use sort of our most precise measurement tools to derive, even when we drill down into our particle accelerators and we have really pristine, clear data, none of that is effect is, is unaffected by our position, our standpoint as observers in the universe. That's what I'm going to talk about now, but at the time, this was not obvious, or at least it was obvious only to philosophers and not to practitioners like Laplace. There were many people at the time, people like Hume and Barclay and all sorts of philosophers sort of raising their hands and saying, um, excuse me, I don't think this quite works. Um, I don't know why that's Barclay's voice, but I guess it is. Excuse me, sir, I think that you will always be an observer in the universe. Um, <laughs> but but that, that just sort of, I guess, dismissed as like this, these little... Uh, academicians and, and clerics in their ivory towers kind of making these objections. And they steamrolled, right, people like Laplace steamrolled right on over that. And, and that idea, even though it is no, no longer even a scientific idea, in other words, even our science doesn't support this idea anymore, but it's been a very powerful idea because I think in one way it taps right into an ancient issue. And this is why it has helped me to understand the Marcus Aurelius quote that either there is providence or atoms. Because when Marcus Aurelius wrote what we now call his, his meditations, this is a very famous work of classic literature, and I think a lot of people are reading it these days because Aurelius is kind of an appealing character. When he composed it, he was really talking to himself. The title that we have in the Greek manuscripts of, of this book is Ta Ace He Auton, which just means like notes to himself. And so that's part of what's so moving about the book is that it's this second century AD Roman emperor, master of the world. And we get in on his 
self-doubt, his his little admonitions to himself, the things he's always saying. And, and anybody that really strives for excellence, I think, is familiar with the kind of way that Aurelius talks to himself. Like, you wake up every morning and you think, ah, Spencer, like, don't just lay around in bed like a lazy sack of you know what, like get out of bed. You know, you, you tell yourself these things over and over again. You have to tell them, every, tell you, you have to say them every day, essentially. And that's kind of like daily affirmations would be a funny modern title for, for Marcus Aurelius meditations. But, and so that's what he's doing. And one of the things he keeps coming back to, as I said at the jump, at the opening of this episode, one of the things he keeps coming back to is either there is providence or atoms. And when I ever I come across that, I'd be like, "What, what, what you doing, Aurelius?" Like, I, I sort of get that, you know. I, I, I think I know the context here. Aurelius is a Stoic. He believes basically in the system of Stoicism, and Providence or Adams is like a classic contrast between Stoicism and Epicureanism. So the Stoics were the ones that believed in providence or fate, that everything is part of a master logos, an overarching plan or kind of a universal reason that threads through everything. And for the Stoics, logos or pneuma, spirit, even sometimes pure fire or, or just Zeus, the king of the gods, there, these were all different words that the Stoics had for this power that was infused everywhere into nature. And the whole universe had matter, but then the matter was imbued with this governing reason or, or spirit. And that's why, much as our modern physicists now say everything, you know, obeys these, these natural laws, for the Stoics, everything had a pattern of cause and effect that was governed by this logos, by, by reason. And there was nothing in the world that happened that wasn't, in some sense, part of this larger plan. So even if you felt like something was kind of a drag, or some guy was kind of a pain in the neck, you could tell yourself, but somewhere in the universe, this whole, this all shakes out. Somewhere in the grand scheme of things, there's a cosmic meaning to, to all of this. And so I can contend with this person because he couldn't really be other than he is. Like, you know, Carol in the cubicle next to me that is always passive aggressively asking me to refill the stapler might be like totally annoying, but she's part of somehow the, the logos, the plan. So that's providence, right? That's one option. And then Adams is like the Epicurean option, which is even more like our sort of scientistic idea that everything is just these particles moving around. And so it's sort of a contrast between the divine plan versus randomness, versus chaos and just, you know, atoms moving around all over the place. And the thing about this that always kind of bugged me, though, is like, okay, but it was the Epicureans, actually, who believed in free will sort of more deeply than the Stoics did, because the Stoics thought everything is part of this divine plan. So really, you can't actually make choices except in your cognitive attitude. You can decide how to feel about something, but you, too, are folded into this whole cosmic order, this whole cosmic scheme of things. And for the Epicureans, that's not true, because even though everything is made of atoms bouncing off of each other and moving around, there is something called a swerve. There's something called, in, in Latin, the word is clinamen. And I talked about this, I think, last week, that there's a random motion in atoms that causes things to deviate from the normal path that we would expect if they were just mechanical objects, a la Laplace. And so Laplace is closest to an Epicurean, but you'll notice that he doesn't believe what the Epicureans believe, which is that there is sometimes an interruption in the order of things. And so now I want to read to you just a little passage from Lucretius De Rerum Natura on the, on the order of things or on the nature of things. And this is the epic poem that really gives us a lot of what we know about Epicureanism. We do have some significant material from Epicurus himself, but some things, like the swerve, only appear in this Latin poem where Le Lucretius is like explaining. It's kind of a, a primer, it's like a handbook or a, even a self-help book for the upper crust of the Romans on how to believe in Epicureanism. And this is where he starts to get into this idea of the, the atomic swerve that enables us to make truly free 
choices. And the mecha- the mechanics of it aren't quite clear, but it, the, the idea of it is clear enough. This is book two of the De Rerum Natura. I'm reading here from my own translation, and I have a, a, an edition of the Epicureans called Gateway to the Epicureans that, that's coming out. There's one that I did uh, last year on the Stoics called Gateway to the Stoics, which you can find on uh, Amazon or wherever books are sold. I'll drop a link to it in the, in the show notes. And then I've been working on this new one on the Epicureans, and I wrote my own translation of some passages from Lucretius. So I'm going to read to you now my own translation of, of how it is that the atoms swerve. So this is how the Epicureans break the chain of, of determinism. So he's basically saying that you know, if there were no swerve, if there were no random motion in atoms, then all the atoms would just fall down to the ground in a big rain. Nothing would ever happen. There would be no cosmic formation. We would now say there would be no no nebular hypothesis. There would be nothing except for just, you know, the raw materials of stuff. But he says, plain and ready evidence can show that weights will never fall in curving lines if dropped from elevated vantage points and left to plummet of their own accord. So he's saying if atoms were just left on their own, they would just fall. They never waver so far off their paths that we can watch and see them deviate. But who could ever possibly perceive with total certainty that no slight curve disturbs their downward motion? After all, If every motion follows from the last, and every movement that occurs is linked to every other by necessity, if nothing ever deviates or jogs from its original trajectory or breaks the bonds of fate which lock the world within a chain of causes and effects eternally, then how could souls be free? And yet they are. In every place on earth where living beings breathe, again I say, free will defies the fates. How could it be that each man goes wherever free will leads, not at some predetermined time or place, his changing course mapped out by destiny, but as his independent mind decrees? Lucretius is great, man. He's one of the real lights, the the real luminaries of of this period in Latin poetry. And man, I have to say, that's a great translation. I wonder who, oh, that was my translation. (laughs) I actually am am very pleased with this translation. I hope you guys are going to like it too, but that's a separate issue you see that what he's saying is there is free will we know that there are things which in greek we would describe as ephemin that which is up to us and this comes from a longer tradition going back to aristotle and plato and socrates of of puzzling over what things we can really be morally responsible for nobody says that i'm morally responsible for the rain that's falling today because i obviously didn't cause it to happen. Nothing that I chose could cause it to happen or cause it not to happen, except in some very distant climate changey sort of sense. And that's one reason why the over interconnectedness of the climate change maximalist view is kind of crazy and crushing is because it creates a world where everything is in some sense F him in, right? And we, we know that doesn't quite work. That's not that's not it. But I am responsible for whether this podcast is any good or not. And I'm responsible if I if I told a lie to you on this podcast, that would be morally wrong because I have the ability not to do that. So we know that there's a sphere within which we are morally responsible and there's a sphere outside of which we're not morally responsible. And drawing that line is really important. And the Epicureans say, rightly, I think, that we can't say anything moral at all, unless we really think that things are up to us, that we have free will and can make this choice. And and that leads them to propose that there is randomness in the universe, that there's a break in the otherwise hermetically sealed materialist logic of how atoms move. And it was thinking about this that really finally cracked for me this providence or atoms thing with Aurelius, because when you get to Aurelius, you have to understand he's not talking really about systematic philosophy. He's not reasoning out in clean lines, this or that idea. He's talking to himself and thinking over problems. And when he says either there's providence or atoms, what he's saying is everything must be fated because the only way for things not to be fated is for there to be this atomic randomness that is to have to introduce kind of chaos and indeterminacy into the universe. And we know that's not true. We know the universe is ordered and therefore there there is providence. And so don't worry about these other things because everything is in some sense fated. And, and this is 
an ancient predicament that I think we now confront again in the scientific revolution era, that if the universe is bounded, if there's nothing outside the universe, and this was true for the Stoics, even though there was logos, spirit, or reason flowing through the universe, there was nothing outside the universe. Everything was, was the universe. And if that's true, then either there is order, and we have no free will, or we have free will and order is interrupted and or is broken and is chaotic and in this Epicurean way that there's atoms are just atoms flowing around and every now and then they kind of swerve randomly. And so for a bounded universe philosopher like Aurelius or many of the ancient philosophers, for somebody that believes there's nothing outside the natural world, you, you really have a choice between fate, determinism, and randomness or chaos and this is why in for example some of the more i won't say sophisticated but exacting texts about stoicism you get these arguments about how we actually are just operating according to our natures and and here's aurelius again right the universe is either a confusion and a mutual involution of things and a dispersion, or it is unity and order and providence. He's saying within the universe, if that's all there is, you can't have both of these things at once. And we get a similar argument reported by Alexander of Aphrodisias, who's real a real backbencher, but fun to read. And he's asking whether anything can really be f him in up to us, whether we really have choice over anything. And he says, if those things in our power are those over the carrying out or not carrying out of which we seem to be in positions of authority and of these it is not possible to say that fate is a cause nor that there are any beginnings and extrinsic antecedent causes of the absolute occurrence or non-occurrence of them I'm going to get to what all this means in just a second I promise for nothing would be any longer in our power than the remaining alternative is to say that fate is in the class of things which happen by nature because fate and nature is the same thing so Huh? <laughs> he's arguing against the Stoics here, and he's saying the Stoics create a world where they want moral reasoning. They want us to judge morally. And yet they say that everything is bounded in this one logic, and therefore fate really does determine our actions. It's sort of like we're a cylinder rolling down a hill or a cone rolling down a hill. Cylinders and cones roll down hills in different patterns, but it's because of something inherent in the logic of what they are, not really. We wouldn't blame a cylinder for rolling differently than a cone down a hill, right? And this problem, the problem of the bounded universe, comes up again in the era of Laplace. And this is now back to the modern day and why all of this has suddenly started to fit together for me is because the Christian idea, and also indeed the, the Jewish idea from, from Genesis, from, from really chapter one of Genesis, is that the universe is ordered. It is basically constructed according to a set of patterns that the sun rises and falls and there are markers and symbols of the heavens in the sky. The Moedim are what the, the stars and the, the sun and the moon and everything are, are part of this intricate pattern that does have an order to it. But the order is determined from outside, from a place of absolute freedom. And that's God, right? God is the mind who's able to speak that order into existence. And Genesis then becomes a kind of middle path between providence and atoms, between the two absolute extremes that Aurelius is caught, trapped between. Because it says, yeah, there is an order, but there is also, the order is contained within a mind. And the mind is not what we would call coterminous with the universe in the way that the Stoic Logos is. So the Stoic Logos, the, the reason that runs through the world in Stoicism, is coterminous with it, ends at the same place as the universe ends. So the boundedness of the universe is also a boundedness of, of reason. And everything is kind of one big package, and it, it all is bounded up together. So there's nothing from outside of that universe, that Logos, that can break in. And so the Christian and the Jewish worldview is that there is something from outside, and that's why there's an order at all, that this mind was the first thing, and it created the order. It didn't have to create the order. It could have created the order differently, but it freely chose, the mind of God freely chose, and now the order is the way that it is, and unless he intervenes, it stays the way that it is. 
this solves a lot of the free will determinism problems because if if the human soul can connect to that absolute place of freedom, then we too, in the image of God, are like little miracles. We're like little deities, right? That we have this spark of reason or freedom or logos or soul that is not identical with the whole heavens, with everything in the world, but connects to something outside the world and makes us free, makes us able to choose. So it solves that problem, but everything comes with trade-offs. And the trade-off that you get when you adopt this Christian worldview is that now miracles are possible. Now our understanding of the world as bounded by laws is not exhaustive and can be interrupted by the possibility of intervention from outside. And this creates a universe that is reasonable, reasonable rational, but not mechanistic, not a machine. And I happen to believe that that is actually the universe in which we find ourselves. In fact, it explains this immediate experience we have of being free while also retaining and honoring the perception that we have at the same time that the world has an order. And so really, Genesis, if you think about it, is kind of brilliant, is, among other things, a genius intervention into philosophical debates that wouldn't even take place until many hundreds of years later on almost as if it were divinely inspired. Sorry, I know that's controversial to say. But anyway, that's sort of, I think, the brilliance of the Jewish cosmology and the Christian worldview that emerges out of it. But once you start going down the Laplace road, the miracle part of it becomes unacceptable because the world is now supposed to be reduced to just the rational order part. And we're back in the crisis of providence or atoms. We're back in Marcus Aurelius' dilemma that either there is order and nothing can be chosen freely or there is randomness and things can be chosen freely, which explains now why the major crisis that has emerged over the last 100 years or so is precisely a crisis of randomness in mathematics. And this is is not fully yet, I don't think, understood by most people, even people that kind of know that quantum physics happens and exists and that there have been real developments in physics over the last hundred years or so. If you want to really come to grips with this, there is a book you have to read, and unfortunately, it's difficulty level very, very high, because <laughs> when I read this book, and th this will tell you you know, I, I have a, a, a real, at this point, I would almost say professional interest in the philosophy of science, but I am no question an interloper in this world. And so when I read this book, I felt a little bit like L. Woods in Legally Blonde. I was like, there's like a lot of math in this book, like a lot of like equations. So I don't know, like I had to work really hard to understand this book. It took me a really long time. Okay. Um, and just to warn you that this book by Thomas Kuhn, who's one of the great philosophers of science, um, is, is thorny going, but also brilliant. Also, once you do you know, break your head against the equations. What he's saying in it is is a magnificent work of scientific history. Kuhn is most famous for his book called The uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which made a big splash because he was arguing about these exact kinds of transitions in science from one governing theory to another, and he was arguing that they're incommensurable, that they are total world shifts that render what went before actually unintelligible or illegitimate. And I'm not so sure how much I agree with him about that, but he was also, un much like Laplace, his one major achievement or his one most famous achievement obscured a lot of other stuff. Like he wrote a great book about Copernicus, the Copernican Revolution, that is well worth reading and not super math heavy and very intuitive if you're interested in that. He also wrote this book called, and I'm, I've got it here, Black Body Theory, and the Quantum Discontinuity, 1894 to 1912. So this is like, I think it's fair to say, a scholarly monograph. It is, this is not written for a general audience, but there are some things in it that would interest a general audience, and one of them I just wanted to pick out for you, which is about the problem in physics that came before quantum physics and led into quantum physics, but only in an indirect way, and that is the problem of not Laplace's demon, but Maxwell's demon. And I, one of the things I love about science is that there's always demons all around um, for, some, for some reason or other. It's almost as if human knowledge is a great 
blessing, and the powers of hell are constantly trying to snatch it from us or pervert it or distort it. I know, it sounds crazy. Um, but he's writing here, Kuhn is writing about James Clark Maxwell, who, along with Michael Faraday, is really the father of electromagnetism. That's what he's best known for, for figuring out that electricity and magnetism are two parts of the same phenomenon, and that, that phenomenon is light, and light is part of a larger spectrum and all of this stuff. But that's not what is most important here. Here he's talking about the second law of thermodynamics, which you may remember from high school physics, or maybe not. That's okay. No shame here. Either way, the second law of thermodynamics is that one way of putting it is that chaos increases over time naturally. If you picture, for example, a bunch of gas molecules in a room that you let out a little cloud of, say, nitrogen gas into a, a room— the molecules in the uh, in the gas will bounce around and they will decrease in order until they're d dispersed throughout the whole room. And this is just one instance of a general law that seems to hold entropy increases is another way of, of putting it. And what Maxwell realized is that in principle, there's no rational reason why the law the second law of thermodynamics should be true. And that's important. I mean, the second law of thermodynamics is, is why we can't make a perpetual motion machine. I mean, it's, it's kind of a fundamental constant of reality that bounds our possibilities. But he's saying it's not a law in the sense of being rationally inevitable. In other words, you can picture a way to break the law. And that's what Maxwell's demon is about. He says... The law is undoubtedly true as long as we can deal with bodies only in mass and have no power of perceiving or handling the separate molecules of which they are made up. But if we conceive a being, here's another one of these all-knowing beings, right, whose faculties are so sharpened that he can follow every molecule in its course, such a being, whose attributes are still as essentially finite as our own, would be able to do what is at present impossible for us, for we have seen that the molecules in a vessel full of air at uniform temperature are moving with velocities by no means uniform, though the mean velocity of any great number of them arbitrarily selected is almost exactly uniform. Now let us suppose that such a vessel is divided into two portions, A and B, by a division in which there is a small hole, and that a being who can see the individual molecules opens and closes this hole so as, allow, so as to allow only the swifter molecules to pass from A to B, and only the slower ones to pass from B to A. He will thus, without the expenditure of work, raise the temperature of B. So he's saying there is a way, essentially, to increase the uh, energy in one side of this room without doing work, without inputting force, essentially, into the system, which would basically undo or, or would violate the second law of thermodynamics. So the reason that this, is, this demon is important as a thought experiment is because laws of physics are supposed to be, in some sense, tautologies. In other words, once you understand them, they're supposed to be inevitable. That It's irrational to imagine them not existing. And here Maxwell has come up with a scenario at the molecular level where you could actually imagine the second law of thermodynamics being violated. Now, this seems perhaps like a very obscure academic parlor game, except for the solution, which is really the problem. The, the solution to this problem is such a huge problem in and of itself that it really gives rise to a revolution in physics, which is you get this guy Ludwig Boltzmann who comes along and he basically says, yeah, it's actually true that at the molecular level, at the level of the particle, there's no, there's no reason for the second law of thermodynamics to be true. It's just that we can show statistically that there's a very, very, very high probability that in the aggregate, the second law of thermodynamics will always be true. In other words, every individual collision between two molecules can happen in a range of different ways and is not locked the way Laplace thought it is into this absolute course of things, that there isn't a kind of atomic determinism operative at the very smallest level. And there's really a little bit of randomness but the randomness is such that certain things are way, way more likely to happen than others. And so by the time you get to the level of things we can see, that randomness has basically been filtered out. And what this looks like is something very, very similar to atomic swerve. It's saying there is a randomness in 
inherent in things, in the laws of things, that give rise to the order that we see at at the uh, l- highest level of things. Okay, so now we're basically just Epicureans again, right? Now we're back to either there's providence or atoms, and the answer is there's atoms, and there's this little bit of chaos and randomness in it that perhaps allows for there to be contingency in the world, but it doesn't. It all cancels out basically in the end. Ah, but wait. Statistical mechanics, which is what Boltzmann's mathematics is called, is, is this theory that kind of introduces randomness as a fundamental ingredient. It's not just a feature of not knowing enough the way Laplace thought it was. It's an actual baseline reality or you know raw material of, of existence. And there are some things that can't be known with any greater certainty until they happen. This kind of thinking is then picked up by none other than Max Planck, who's kind of known as the father of quantum physics for his work on black body radiation, which is what this book by Kuhn is ultimately about. And Planck is working on a very different problem, which is the sort of grades of radiation at which light can be emitted, like stages of of energy that, that light can take on. And what he discovers is that that randomness or that indeterminacy is not just part of the motion of particles, but part essentially of the existence or the nature of particles in their very essence. And it would take a whole other episode to go into like the history of how this happens and Einstein gets involved and starts to figure out that light is kind of at at once a particle and a wave. And then you start to get things like the double slit experiment and Bohr's interpretation and all of that. But for our purposes, all we have to know is that the indeterminacy of Boltzmann's mathematics gets kind of translated over in an analogous sense into the very building blocks of the universe until it starts to look like actually the machinery of Laplace's kind of perfect Newtonian mechanics is in some sense constructed in conversation with our perception, with with a mind. And lest you think that this is just, you know, ancient history, I want to read to you from one other book which was published very, very recently called Putting Ourselves Back into the Equation. This is by George Musser, I think is how you pronounce his name. And it's a really smart book in a lot of ways, but it's about the AI revolution and about how many of the problems that we're currently dealing with in in physics are random at exactly the level of human perception. It is exactly at the point when a human mind enters into perception or into relationship with the outside world that this inherent randomness gets resolved almost as if the human mind and the human consciousness is a kind of link to the freedom that is able to make form out of chaos and so here's just a little quick passage from the opening of this book he says systems of particles and systems of neurons and by this he means the um, digital neurons that make up an ai Uh, program. Systems of particles and systems of neurons are alike in their inscrutability. It is hopeless to try and track each and every molecule in a room full of air. He's referring here to Maxwell's demon. Hence the statistical and statistical physics, which describes the behavior of particles in terms of probabilities rather than in terms of absolute certainty. The reason that Laplace's essay was an essay on probability is because he was saying you don't have to do that. You don't have to. If you knew enough information, you wouldn't need just, oh, it's likely that this particle is going to go this way or that way, and there's a 5% likelihood of this and a 95% of that. You would know with certainty where everything is going. Boltzmann's mathematics says that's not true, right? And so that's what Musser is writing about. He says, neural networks, too, are so enormous that you can't predict with absolute certainty what they'll do. This is one part of like ChatGPT and MidJourney and all these programs that we're all now futzing around with on the internet. They do, they churn numbers at such an enormous rate and, and magnitude that we don't really know exactly what's going on inside. This makes them like humans, and this isn't necessarily what their users want because they are too complex to program in the traditional way and must instead be taught they can be misled, and so on and so forth. So what Musser's writing about in this whole book, and the whole book is really worth reading and and very interesting, but what he's writing about is the fact that many problems in cosmology, in AI, in neurophysics, in astrophysics, and neurochemistry rather, in astrophysics, all of these different disciplines are coming up against the fact that the human mind is in some sense 
fundamentally, if not random, indeterminate, that it doesn't, it isn't bounded by laws of absolute cause and effect, the way that Laplace thought it was. The, the universe is not simply a Newtonian machine, and it seems as if in the core of reality, at the level of the photon and the level of the Planck space and the level of just that where, where, where quantum indeterminacy essentially starts to enter in, there is something in the universe that answers to the indeterminacy of the human mind. Almost as if at the bedrock of existence, there is something outside of nature which makes nature rational but free. And within the human mind, there is a free choice of the will that connects us to that which is outside of the bounded laws of nature. I mean, I, I, I'm totally crazy here, but this sort of sounds like a universe spoken into existence by a mind that orders it rationally and yet places a free being within that universe to be his image and connect to that which is outside of nature by making free choice. This is now, I, I know I'm indulging in crazy conspiracy theories, but basically what I'm arguing to you is that ever since Laplace and ever since the kind of peak Newtonian moment, we have been on this journey back into the bounded universe of the ancients, of the Stoics and the Epicureans, where our two options are essentially total order, in which case there's no free will, or inherent randomness, in which case there's no order. And scientists who are very good at perceiving order have crashed up against the fact that randomness or indeterminacy is necessary to describe the most fundamental building blocks of the universe. And it turns out our minds are also the, the one other thing in the universe that operates on this principle which introduces freedom into the universe. And so if we want to retain our idea that there is such a thing as order in the universe, in which case we can keep doing science, if we want to keep doing science at all and believe in order, we also have to believe in a freedom which is outside of the natural world and also yet somehow lives in us. That's where all of this is going. That's the story that I've been wanting to tell you for a while because I think it is so exciting, so up to the minute. It's from, and yet so ancient, right? It's a classic young heretics in that it goes way, way back into the debates between the Epicureans and the Stoics. And yet it's happening right now. Watch this space because I think there's going to be more on this to come. And we are going to keep talking about it next week. But for now, let me briefly take a mailbag question. And actually, before I take a mailbag question, I'm going to do my latest segment, which is called I Maked This. And this is where instead of rattling off to you all the things that I'm out there doing, I just pick one thing that I think you might like that I've made. And this time, there's a perfect tie-in to my book, uh, Gateway to the Stoics. And I say it's my book. It's really a translation that I did not do of Marcus Aurelius with a, a new forward by me, kind of a curated edition uh, called Gateway to the Stoics. And there's a companion volume coming out with translations that I did do called Gateway to the Epicureans. And if you're interested in the ancient side of this and, and in ancient philosophy more generally in the Hellenistic schools, I think you'll really enjoy the use of those books. They're handy dandy. Uh, you can pre-order one and order the other on Amazon. I will drop a link in the show notes. Uh, go check them out. I read from the translation in the Epicureans one today. So if you found that lucid and interesting, go take a look. Okay, mailbag questions come to me through Substack at rejoiceevermore.substack.com. And today I have one that it came in the DMs, the direct messages on Substack, which speaks to a lot of what I've been dealing with today. So Joshua writes in, he says, I'm not sure where to put this, so I just decided to put it here. With all the talk of magic and technology and Merlin and Faust, it puts some ideas together for me. The idea that Satan tempted us with knowledge, the idea that the Watchers, fallen angels, introduced tools to humanity, the idea that Merlin's father was a demon and that Faust sold his soul for knowledge and power, even the idea in Exodus that alters to... Uh, that altars to God must be made of uncut, unworked stone seem to be connected. Is it perhaps that knowledge to understand the how and why and tools to have the ability to affect is something like power, mastery, to be able to do and know? But why does this idea recur as something demonic? Yeah, so, I mean, this is like, talk about lines that you can puzzle over again and again and never quite fully understand. The one that is boggling to people, myself included, is the temptation of 
Eve in the garden when the serpent says, if you eat of this fruit, ye shall become as gods, knowing good and evil. And many people, including myself, want to say, well, knowledge is not an inherently evil thing, is it? God didn't want us to just not know anything when he put us in the garden. And even good and evil, of course, moral reasoning is one of the positive faculties that we have. And you could say, well, you know, we shouldn't have ever known evil at all, and we shouldn't have had any direct contact with it, so we should have just known good. And there's there's some truth to that, but of course knowing good implies at least being able to conceive of the alternative to good, which is which is evil. So what was so wrong about that offer? What was it that really, you know, corrupted? And I do think that this whole set of conversations we've been having about being in nature and being outside of nature is is related to what that temptation means. I don't think it's that knowledge is inherently wrong for us to have or perceive. I think it's the part where we're to be as gods. And it goes back to that part of Laplace where he compares the perfect deist mind that knows this machine from the outside in with imperfect human understanding. And I think that is actually, again, not to make Laplace like the villain of the world, but this strain of thought is the serpent's strain of thought that the kind of knowledge you're able to have of limited, bounded sections of the universe is the kind that you will then have of the whole universe. You will be able to become like gods, that is, become like consciousnesses that are not within nature, that are outside of all nature, and look in on nature and and judge for yourselves what is good and evil, rather than receiving knowledge and freedom and goodness from outside, from a place outside of nature, and therefore higher than yourselves. And to abstract your own mind out of the universe, this is kind of what I was talking about with Faust, to take yourself out of the universe and try to get the God's eye view of things, is to make the world into an object or a tool for you to manipulate and play with via technology. And this goes to the most extreme versions of what we're now seeing, where people are proposing to, you know, do a great reset and make everything into this perfectly organized Tower of Babel. But it also, I think, is just inherent in our temptation every day to reason and think about things without love, without an inner knowledge that other people are also souls and minds, and that our mind is not the kind of absolute arbiter that gets to stand outside and judge and manipulate the world as a dead thing. We're always in relationship. We, we are not the only beings that have this indeterminacy, this free will, this ability to make choices. There is also in the world a connection to that which is greater than nature, to a freedom outside of nature. And by making, when we're making choices, we're always in communion and relationship with it. And cutting yourself off from that does give you a certain kind of power. It's a maniacal, Thrasymachian, or, or even Nietzschean power, where the world becomes your object. But you're able then to manipulate it exactly as your arbitrary will determines, and you become, as gods, the problem is you lose your humanity, because you lose your sense of yourself as a soul that is in nature, and that is able, essentially, to make choices. And that's why Faust begins by wanting power over the whole world and ends powerless to even make the one choice that would save him. He can't even ask for repentance because he's been convinced that everything is bounded into this machine world that he wanted so that he could control it, but now he's bound up in it too. And this is why those who make idols will become like them, that they craft gods out of stone and say that they have eyes but see not, and then they themselves become parts of this machine world and, and can no longer make choices and be free because to be free, there has to be something outside of nature, which means there's something higher than you and beyond you. So I think that's what that temptation is about. I'm sure among other things, that's just my read on it. And it's a great question. So thank you, Joshua, for pitching me a, a softball that was right down the line of what I wanted to talk about today. I hope you enjoy this show. I, it is always just a rip roaring good time for me. I'll be back next week. Please subscribe and rate five stars and tell the world, uh, share on social media, however you get the word out. And I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. Thank you.